cracks. It was more like ice dust. That was how they described yeah. it. And it would web up your eyelashes and kind of glue them to freeze them together um, and scour your skin. Anyway, so this storm came up very suddenly. And what happened was, especially in Nebraska, um, it came during the school day. And it- this podcast is certified fresh. Freshmediaworks.com Welcome to Lunch with Chris, where your host, Chris Daly, brings you uplifting interviews with extraordinary individuals making a positive impact. Join as he introduces remarkable people who have left their mark on their respective fields. I read my next guest's book a while back and was fascinated by it. A segment of our history that I had never heard about, and I'm guessing you might not have either. It was uh, so dramatic. I will introduce you to David Laskin in his book, The Children's Blizzard. Have you ever thought about doing your own podcast? It is the absolute best way to grow your brand, spread your message, and build your following. Fresh Media Works can help. We do all the heavy lifting, and you just focus on your message. To find out how easy we can make launching your new podcast, call 713-269-4620 or check us out at freshmediaworks.com. All right, everybody join me in welcoming author David Laskin, author of The Children's Blizzard, to the show. David, how are you today? I'm great. How about you? Excellent. I tell you... um, I read a ton of books. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm on Goodreads where you can track your goal. So I, my goal is always 52 books a year, and I read about 80. <laughs> so, uh, and I, out of the last couple years, when I read The Children's Blizzard, that one I read the quickest. It was mm. fascinating. Uh, and and I want to talk about that, but first I want to go back and talk about you. Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in New York State on Long Island, outside New York City, uh, so no place near where the children's blizzard happened. <laughs> nice, nice. And what got you into uh, writing? What was your career path? Well, I when I finished grad school um, back in the 70s, so I'm an old guy, I uh, worked in publishing for a while in New York, and I quickly learned that I was really not cut out to be an editor. But I loved the writing part of it, and I'd always been drawn to writing. Um, You know, it seemed a little presumptuous to just kind of hang up my shingle as a writer and say, okay, now Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a freelance writer. So I kind of edged into it. Um, I had uh, the good thing about working in publishing is I had some contacts in the area. And um, so when I left my job with Bantam Books, I began to do kind of small projects, um, writing Mm -hmm. projects, of various things, and those led to bigger projects. And the first book I ever published was called The Esquire Wine and Liquor Handbook, which yes. was published by Esquire magazine. And it was exactly what it sounds like kind of, you know, a, a, an exploration of the world of alcohol. I was certainly not an expert um, in that area, but I became a lot more adept after researching yeah. that book. But um, so initially, I was writing books kind of for hire that books uh-huh. that other come up with the ideas and ask me um you know to 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 kind of become an instant expert but eventually, I began to write about what I wanted to write about, whether it was one of those <clears throat> topics that I've always been fascinated by, and mm-hmm. that's what led to the children's blizzard. Nice. And so what else did you publish before the Children's Blizzard, other oh. than the, the wine? Yeah, other than that, well, I wrote a couple. I have three kids. They're all grown up now. Now I have grandkids. Mm-hmm. But um, when they were young, I began to do some writing about um, child rearing. So I wrote a book for Parents Magazine called The Parents Book for New Fathers. I wrote a book about getting into advertising, which I'd never worked in, but, mm-hmm. you know, again, became kind of an instant expert. And then I started to do some travel writing. Um, I I published frequently in the New York Times travel section, and I wrote a book. One of my early books was called Eastern Islands, which is about all the islands on the East Coast 
that yeah. you can get to by ferry or you know by public ferry. Um, so it was everything from Liberty Island, where the Statue of Liberty is, to Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, down to the Keys. Even though the Keys, for the most part in Florida, are connected by roads, there are some that you can right. only get to by island. And I kind of threw in Key West just because it's so cool. So that was yeah. that was an area that I wrote in um, before I started doing weather writing. Nice. And so, and so, what got you involved with or interested in the children's blizzard story? Yeah. So, I wrote a book um, called "Braving the Elements: The Stormy mm-hmm. History of American Weather," and that was again exactly what it sounds like—a kind of cultural history of weather in the United States. So, everything from, uh, let's say, Thanksgiving, which is uh, the first Thanksgiving, was in part a prayer service. Uh, and a time of drought in the in the New England colonies, uh, beseeching God to bring rain, and really all the way up to like the Weather Channel and our modern forecasting techniques and and weather media. Anyway, in the course of writing that book, I came upon many references to this massive, deadly storm that hit mm-hmm. the upper Midwest on January 12, 1888, which the pioneers called the children's blizzard or the school children's blizzard. And I did make a brief reference to that storm in the book, in the Braving the Elements, um, just a couple pages. But it stuck right. in my mind, and I thought, you know, there's just a lot here. I mean, people, there's so many accounts by pioneers and homesteaders of how severe, how sudden, how deadly, yeah. how frightening that event was. And so at some point I decided, hey, you know, why don't I go back to that and see what else I can find? And that was the the origin of the children's blizzard, the book. Nice. Uh, well, I tell you, I found it and I, I must have read the book cover or something that intrigued me. I'm not a weather guy at all, mm-hmm. uh, but... Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it was a page turner, uh, like completely. Uh, if you could, people like me who may not have known anything about it, just give an overview of what what the event was. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. So, um, in brief, um, again, we're we're talking about January twelfth, eighteen eighty eight, and we're mm-hmm. talking about the Upper Midwest. So, pr- primarily North and South Dakota, and um, a little bit into Nebraska and uh, and Iowa. So on that morning, it was very mild for winter in that part of the country. And the pioneers, the accounts say, oh, it was like in the 60s, which it wasn't. But it mm-hmm. was um, probably in the 40s, which for them in that, in that time, pre climate change yeah. and so on, felt pretty pretty darn warm. So And it had been very cold. So a lot of farmers who hadn't been able to get out into their fields, went out far from home, watering the livestock. Kids went to school, often without proper clothing, um, just figuring, oh, you know, it's the January thaw. That's basically what people thought. And then very, very suddenly, this incredible storm came up. And, and you know from having read the book, they're just really intense descriptions of this kind of wall of black clouds that came out of the Northwest with very little warning, and just the temperatures plunged in a matter of minutes. And those, I do actually did find records to to substantiate the yeah. claims of the survivors. It was incredible, you know, drop in temperature, very rapid, very severe, some of the coldest temperatures ever measured in that part of the country hit. And there, there was some snow. It wasn't a ton of snow. But the problem was it was blowing sideways and there was mm-hmm. zero visibility. And not only that, it was it wasn't really kind of the way you think of as, you know, Christmas card snow of light fluffy <laughs> flakes. It was more like ice dust. That was how they described yeah. it. And it would web up your eyelashes and kind of glue them to freeze them together. Um, and scour your skin. Anyway, so this storm came up very suddenly, and what happened was, especially in Nebraska, um, it came during the school day. And, you know, so we're talking about Little House on the Prairie, you know, yep. one room schoolhouses, sod huts, and so on. And so many of the teachers were quite young. I mean, if you've read the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, it's that era, it's that um, kind of setup where there's a young teacher 
hardly mm-hmm. older than her kids um, in a one-room schoolhouse, and many of them just said, okay, kids, run for home. You know, you'd be better off at home than in the schoolhouse. We don't have enough fuel. And sometimes these storms would last for days, so they, they kind of thought, well, you know, they did this kind of calculation, well, probably better off running for home than being trapped here with no food or, or fuel. Mm-hmm. And what happened was many kids didn't make it home, and they yeah. got lost. You know, we're talking about the prairies where there really was not um, any landmarks to speak of, even on even on fair weather. It, you know, it was kind of a featureless, treeless part of the country. But you can imagine with a blinding snowstorm, kids got lost and froze to death. And not yeah. only kids, but um, especially kids. And that was why it was called the school children's blizzard, because so many of the victims were kids. So basically, that was the setup. And what I do in the book, as you know, is choose five families who Mm -hmm. endured that event. And I traced them. Many of them were immigrants from Germany and Scandinavia, came over in search of free land. Some of them were homesteaders from New England or other parts of the country who came to that region um, to farm. And Mm -hmm. they, they really were not accustomed to the suddenness of the weather cycles and the this and the savagery of of a winter storm. And so I follow these families and their kids and what happened to them during uh, that day. You know, the page-turning quality that you mentioned was very deliberate on my part. I wanted the book to read like a novel. <clears throat> mm-hmm. It's all based on fact. It's, I didn't make any of it up. But I wanted it to... Um, have that gripping quality um, so you get involved in the lives of these individuals and in what happens to them. So that's that's the book in brief. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, you mentioned the data, the um, the weather data that you included. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a primarily nonfiction reader, so uh, this, you know, had tons of great data and um, – and you'd give reports from the weather stations that their logs had, mm-hmm. uh, but then you'd, have, like you said, have that human side as well. Right. So you know, the research was huge for this book, as you can imagine, for a couple of reasons. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, I never lived in that part of the country, so I had to mm-hmm. get up to speed on kind of local history. You know, probably things that every you know, 12 year old in Nebraska would know about their state right. history. I had to learn um, mm-hmm. in, you know, the the pioneer period, the homestead period, um, what it's like to farm in that area. Um, but I, so that was one part of it. Um, but in terms of the weather data that you reference, I had really good luck um, with a trip to the National Archives in College Mm -hmm. Park, um, Maryland, outside Washington, D.C. I made a trip there. And so, you know, the Weather Service back then was uh, part of the military. Uh, It was part of the um, it was part of the Signal Corps. And so the records are there. They're kind of all over the place, but um, they exist. And every weather station was manned by a, a a um, officer or a or listed man in the army, and they had to give um, <clears throat> readings. I think it was four times a day: temperature, humidity, wind speed, so on. And often these would just be recorded in logs, so you would just get right. the, the raw data. But for this event, I was really lucky because some of the uh, weather stations that experienced the brunt of the storm, the recorder would add notes in which they would elaborate on the data and really um, give vivid descriptions of the wind shift, the temperature change, the quality of the snow, what it was like to be out in the storm. One guy was up on the roof of the weather station when the storm hit and nearly got blown off. And so those little things, which, you know, you just don't know if it's going to be there. You kind of have to go and check Huron and Sioux Falls and, you know, every little station, um, and there were many, <clears throat> and go through each one. So I got a lot of the data from there. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I did, which really, I think, um, made the book 
gave it that vivid human quality was I put ads in every newspaper in South Dakota and Nebraska. And you, there's a mm-hmm. way to do that. It wasn't really that hard or that expensive. And I just took out a small classified ad saying, author seeking stories of the great blizzard of January 12, 1888. And I got a ton of responses. Yeah. Um, people who's, in one case, a woman who, an elderly woman whose father had survived the storm as a young boy contacted mm-hmm. me, or people who were descended from victims of the storm. Um, so I got tons and tons of responses to that classified ad, and I was able to get in touch with those families. I made many trips to both South Dakota and Nebraska researching the storm and meeting with the families of survivors, or in some cases the families of victims, who you know, kids and adults who did not survive, and was able to put together their family histories, uh, do some of the genealogical work on who their ancestors were, and then tell the story. And some of them had records, letters, and so on. <coughs> So that was um, how I was able to give the book both its kind of scientific depth and accuracy and also the, the human detail and vividness. Yeah, I love you. One, uh, one of the things that uh, that I've discovered as an adult, I'm in my 50s now, but is that you think they taught you history in school, <laughs> but there's so much more history, and, and this is a vivid example of that. That's right. You know, for me, the kind of history that I really um, respond to as an adult is what my editor refers to as bottom-up history. So top-down history would be the generals, the kings, the presidents, the leaders, uh, the rich people, you know, who are famous. Bottom-up history is the little people, the the ordinary men and women and children who survived these events, fought in the wars, uh, came over in search of better lives, um, you know, loved their families, took care of their kids the best they could, uh, dealt with grasshoppers, plagues of various sorts, drought, and, you know, in the case of this book, Blizzard. And so um, I find... You know, every family, if you go back into your family history, you'll you'll see that, that your family endured incredible history. I mean, all of us did. You know, our fathers, grandfathers, what have you, fought in wars and, you know, suffered incredible deprivation and um, just struggled to make a better life, life for themselves or for their families. And mm-hmm. um, so... You know, that kind of history is the history that I am drawn to. And um, in the case of the Children's Blizzard, I um, actually was able to write a book um, using that approach. So nobody in this book is famous. There's no, um, even the people who forecast the storm, and there's Thomas Woodruff, who is the Signal Corps officer in St. Paul, who is in charge of forecasting the storm. He came from a somewhat prominent family, but, you know, obviously not famous. So this is, you know, I I might refer to Greeley, who was head of the Weather Service and Mm -hmm. pretty famous for a polar um, expedition. But, you know, he's kind of the most famous person in the book. So anyway, it's it's really the history of of little people. And, you know, I was able to, a couple books later, I wrote a book about my own family history called The Family, where I was able to take the same approach and talk about their um, engagement with history. So it's an approach that I um, have really embraced. I love that. We're definitely kindred spirits in that. I, I've been doing podcasting for 19 years now, and and I've always tell everybody that I talk to, every single person has a story. It's a great story. You just got to dig in there. And, and you dug into, like I said, one of the most fascinating reads I've had the last couple of years. Well, good. Appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, of course. So, uh, you talk about what was after this, or, or first, let's back up. How was the reception for this book? Well, you know, without bragging too much, I was overwhelmed by the reception. Um, yeah. I, I think part of what made the book 
as popular as it became is that on Thanksgiving of the the when it was published, and I can't remember what year it was, but it's a while ago now. George Will, the columnist, um, devoted his column to the book, and he loved the Homestead Act, and he loved anything to do with homesteading. I didn't know that at the time, but um, so this book obviously touches very closely on homesteading, and he mm -hmm. um, singled it out. So the book became a national bestseller. I mean, it wasn't at the top of the bestseller list by any means, but it, it sold very well. And I think there were a couple of reasons. Um, one, people in in the upper Midwest often feel somewhat neglected uh, by media. You know, there's a lot about the coasts, but less about the center of the country. And so I think that there was a lot of appreciation for the, for the fact that I um, focused on their their state histories, their regional history, their family histories. And so that was kind of one readership. Um, and then, you know, there's a ton of people with roots in the Dakotas or Nebraska or Iowa or what have you in Minnesota whose families have left. I, I live in Seattle and there are many, many people here with Midwestern um, ancestors who decided yep, to keep moving. Both my parents and, came from Minnesota. Yeah. Okay, so there you go. So <laughs> many of those people still got their local newspapers or still had connections to their local communities and they read the book. And I got phone calls from people in California saying, oh, you know, I grew up in such and mm -hmm. such, you know, South Dakota, and I just read your book, and it really brought back stuff. And then I think, you know, they're weather nuts. You know, the other thing is, any book about weather, you kind of have an automatic uh, way to promote it, because every TV station has a weather segment, and newspapers have a weather page. So people are interested in weather. Um, and it just kind of built from there, and it's, you know, it's it's still going. People still read it and buy it, and and I did a lot of um, speaking, touring, um, both in the region and around the country. So it was very gratifying. Of course, I also got stuck in a couple of snowstorms trying to speak <laughs> in Chicago. But, you know, that was my just desserts kind of, you know. Say, that's appropriate, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had that coming. Well, so um, has it been turned into a movie or film or series or anything? And it has not. There's been a lot of talk about it. It's been optioned several times. I, it's gotten close. I met with a director who loved it and said she was writing a screenplay and somebody else who, uh, yeah, I think it would lend itself to that very nicely. But for whatever reasons, it hasn't happened. You know, it's uh, it, uh, the, the, the translation from book to movie is never smooth. And uh, I have a good friend, uh, the, the late writer Ivan Doig, who um, whose work is mostly in fiction, set in Montana, and he had a, he came close to getting a couple of his books made into movies, and he just said, you know, it's you, you get it often what you get out of it is a good lunch with interesting people, and that's as far <laughs> as it goes, and um, that's about as far as it's gone with the children's pleasure. But if any of your listeners uh, are interested, it's the movie rights are available, so I, I'd love to see it. Well, that, that was my next question because I'm interested. I am, oh. like I said, I'm so moved by this. I I totally think this would be a great, probably mini series. Yeah, well, that great. would be super. I'd love to do that, yeah. but um, had it not been done yet. Right. Okay. And so now let's talk about after this one. Uh, what else have you published? Okay. So after the Children's Blizzard, my next book was in this vein, but uh, I, I decided to leave weather and go to war. And I wrote a book, <clears throat> excuse me, about the immigrant experience in the First World War called The Long Way Home from Ellis Island to the Great War. And in that book, I, I chose basically the same approach where I um, followed, I think it was 12 guys um, who were immigrants from Europe. So they were from Italy. There were Russian Jews. There were uh, there was a Swede. Um, there were some Czech um, people from the Czech Republic. Um, who am I leaving out? Uh, Irish. And, you know, kind of the big immigrant groups of that period. Uh, and we're talking about the, the kind of the heyday of Ellis Island. And I followed them from uh, the old country to their settlement in the States. And then they 
And when war, when the U.S. entered World War I in 1917, they either enlisted or were drafted and so shipped back across the ocean that they had crossed to, to come to the, to the land of opportunity and fought for their adoptive country with, in every case, great um, distinction and with great loyalty. Um, two of the guys, one Italian and one Czech, won the Medal of Honor, and um, there were many other stories that they didn't all make it. Um, so that was that was the follow-up to the children's blizzard, the long way home. And then I wrote a book, as I said, about my own family, yeah. called The Family, um, where I <clears throat> used that same approach in tracing the history of my mother's family, and that involves immigration again to the U.S., the founding of the Maiden Form Bra Company, which was founded by my great aunt. Um, relatives of mine were killed in the Holocaust. Others went to Palestine um, to as Zionists to participate in the founding of Israel. So that's kind of the kind of the Jewish 20th century told through one family being yeah. my own family. And then the book I just published a couple of years ago, um, I switched, you know, it, at the ripe old age of whatever I was, 60-something, 60 68, I think, to fiction. So after writing all of these nonfiction books about ordinary people swept up in history, I decided to write what I guess I'd describe as a historical novel called What Sammy Knew about a young kid growing up um, high school senior outside New York City and the book is set in 1970. He gets swept up in all of the crazy politics of the day and mm -hmm. falls in love, um, runs away from home, gets into a lot of trouble and gets in kind of way over his head and, um, well, I won't give too much of the plot away, but yeah. uh, it gets in way over his head and kind of the craziness of, of the late 60s, early 70s. And so that was my first novel, and now I'm working on another novel. So that's kind of the trajectory of my career. I love that. I love that. Um, yeah, I can definitely tell the audience that uh, read the children's blizzard. It's It's a game changer in my mind. Uh, and I know now at, at least I have a couple more books that I'm going to be reading of yours. Okay. How, how can people get a hold of you? How can they find out about you? Yeah. So I have a website. It's my name, David Laskin, D-A-V-I-D-L-A-S-K-I-N dot com. So that's a very easy way to um, find out more about me. I've also published many articles. They're all on the website. Uh, the books are commonly available on Amazon, or <clears throat> I actually w would really encourage your listeners to patronize their local independent bookstores. Um, Amen. I, yeah, I, I love those. And uh, there's books, bookshop.org where you can um, just order it through there, and it'll, you know, your proceeds will go to your independent bookstores. Those, those are really, I think, community builders, and they, I'm, I'm happy to say, they have survived the pandemic and survived, you know, the kind of shakeouts of the publishing industry. And we have a couple of great independent bookstores here in Seattle, but I think pretty much, um, you know, most cities and small cities have a long established beloved independent bookstore and you can even if they don't have it in stock they can always order it for you the children's blizzard is still in print so is the long way home the family and what sammy knew so all of those are readily available but i'd love to hear um from your listeners and they can contact me through my website easy to do that is awesome um i i can't agree enough with with your sentiments there uh <laughs> You know, we as human beings are we we uh, we learn, we grow, we share through stories, and uh, your stories are amazing. Well, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate that.